Given the football games going on right now, you are the most spiritual people in Elk Grove. And the only ones going to heaven. I just want you to know that, all right? All right. We're going to suffer. We're going to suffer together, right? Put up with this guy for one hour. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Probably most of you know, my father actually passed away a couple of weeks ago. He was 93, so his health was failing. But just all the prayers and the notes and the emails and phone calls and meals. It seems like at Creekside, everybody thinks if you're grieving, you're hungry. So they stopped us and just thank you. Just it's been a, uh, you know, I have a number of people in my extended family that don't know Christ. And just this avalanche of love that came in from Creekside was just so, such a, you know, they will know you by your love. And that's what we experienced. So I just want to thank you as a church. It was a, a very rewarding experience to be a part of a body like this. It's great. Uh, about four weeks ago, we started a series of messages called 2020 Vision. And <clears throat> it's a great time to do it. We're starting a brand new year, so we want to refine our spiritual outlook, our spiritual vision, pursuing God with an increasing intensity. And I'm not talking about a New Year's resolution because it's January 19th. Those are already gone, right? I'm talking about a lifestyle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. And so I I, I was thinking as I was prepping for this message about invitations God has extended to Israel and to the human race like Jeremiah 29. You will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with what? With all your heart, and I will be found by you. God isn't playing hide and go seek with us. Seek him and you'll find him, declares the Lord. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. It's about halfway through the Bible. Past the Psalms, you'll find a big prophet called Isaiah. And I want to read, and I want you to actually read with your own eyes this invitation that God throws out to people, fallen people in Isaiah 55, verse 1. He says, come, All you are thirsty, come to the waters, and you have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. It's not an economic transaction. He's inviting you to come to him. He says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. If you skip down to verse 6, it says this. And this is so powerful, I want to put this one on the screen. Here's this invitation from your God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the, un- the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, he will freely pardon. And so we, we see this God of the Bible that's just saying, come to me that you might have life. But we don't just come to God. We come to God and we keep digging. We keep burrowing in further and further and further. You're never going to find an end to your God. And what I thought was interesting, because we're playing on the idea of vision, right? It's 2020. So why not? 2020 vision, right? But when you think about it, as you, as you think through the scriptures and the pages of the Bible, repeatedly God uses the idea of physical sight or light as metaphors for for spiritual understanding and insight. Like thy word is a light unto my path. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. These are just metaphors for us going deeper into God and understanding the words of God and the ways of God and the rhythms of God. So how does a person grow in their capacity to see better the thoughts and ways of God? How do we improve our spiritual vision? And the answer to that question is we increase our investment in spiritual disciplines or healthy habits. There are ways that you can seek the Lord. Nobody grows spiritually by accident. You don't microwave somebody into spiritual maturity. You have to want it and you have to pursue it. 
Uh, one of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Proverbs. It's written by Solomon to his sons. And in the second chapter, he says this. He says, my son, if you call out to, for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. But you've got to want it. You've got to want it more than money. You've got to want it more than the other status symbols that people equate with success in our culture. You have to want it. And so God has given us a number of avenues where we can pursue this kind of spiritual 2020 vision. We, we, we read things that he's revealed to us in his word. We speak conversationally with him in prayer. We, we meet together and gather to worship collectively. There's a power in the church gathered. And then we also practice one another commands in the New Testament about Christian friendships and just doing life together. And we do that in our life groups here, folks. We're a big church, but we also want to be a small church. So if you're not in a life group, get in a life group. I understand a bunch of people are signing up. These are ways to go deep into friendship. And it's just way better to travel through life with friends that are on the same journey as you. But, you know, um, as I was processing this, I thought, do you know what the last recorded words of the Apostle Peter were? The Apostle Peter said a lot of good things, a lot of dumb things. He was a great leader, you know, but... He wrote two letters that are at the end or towards the end of the New Testament, First and Second Peter. And the last verse of the last book of his last recorded words are simply an appeal to do what we've been talking about. He says, grow. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. He says, go for it. Dig. Burrow in. Grow. Prove your sight. So... <coughs> I just want to pray for us right now. Can I do that? And then we'll dive into the passage. Let me pray for you. Jesus, you, you said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So I'm going to pray right now that in 2020, you would increase our hunger and thirst for spiritual reality. Make it more precious to us than other pursuits. And God, I pray that you'd give us insight and understanding we have not had in years past. I pray that your spirit would work with our spirit and lead us into paths of obedience and personal righteousness, doing the right thing, thinking the right things, and divine blessing as well, God. We want your smile on our journey as we travel through this time period called 2020. We know you're outside of time but you've placed us inside of time. So let us redeem these times for your glory and our good, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've brought your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18. We're going to read about a couple of instances in Christ's life towards the end of chapter 18, and they might seem disconnected, but on closer examination, they are very connected. Uh, one of them, uh, they both have to do with vision. They both have to do with physical and spiritual eyesight or understanding of what God's up to. The first is a prediction of the upcoming passion of Jesus, his impending crucifixion or resurrection. And the other story is Jesus literally healing the eyes of a man that was blind so that he could physically see again. I want to read to you the first of these two stories, and we're going to call it, Do You See What I See? Chapter 18... Luke, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and he told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everyone, everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And then it says this three times in different ways. Verse 34, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. That's not very good spiritual vision, is it? So in this first brief episode, Jesus is predicting his upcoming violent death and his subsequent resurrection back from the death. 
and his words go right over his disciples' head. They absolutely don't have a clue what he's talking about. They do not see what he sees on the immediate horizon, which makes me want to play a game with you called Do You See What I See? Okay? So pay attention to the screens here. I want to see if you see what I see. Okay? Do you see what I see there? That's the logo for NBC. I'm going to start easy and then work it hard. Okay? Uh, when black and white television was converted into color television, NBC adopted this symbol of multiple colors, but for those that are really looking, they're the plumage of a peacock, and there's a peacock in the middle there. Do you see that? Am I going too fast? I told you I'd start with a really slow pitch, and then we're going to get tricky on you. Ready? How about this one? Have you ever seen this one? You see the smile in that? It's not a smile. It's a logo where they're telling you they have everything from A to Z, and they're on the move. Do you see what I see? That's what they're doing, all right? How about this one? Have you ever received anything from FedEx? Do you know that FedEx has hidden a little tiny um, symbol in their orange letters? It's an arrow. Have you ever seen that? Because they're a company on the move. Do you see what I see? I mean, everybody collectively say it together. Oh, <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, how about this one? This one's fun. It's a football day. Do you see what I see? You've probably seen this chip bag on the shelf for a long time without realizing the middle two T's are people holding a chip, dipping it into a salsa bowl, which is sitting on the top of the eye. Do you see what I say, people? Work with me now, okay? Told you this would be a spiritual day. Or here's one. I lived in Europe, so we got to do this one. Toblerone, okay? Toblerone. Anybody ever had Toblerone chocolate? It's good chocolate. The dark chocolate's even better. And by the way, my birthday's coming really soon, okay? But Toblerone is actually made in the capital city of Switzerland, which is Bern, and they hid the letters B-E-R-N in the name of this chocolate. Do you see them there? B-E-R-N in Toblerone, okay? But the, the symbol for the city of Bern is a bear. This is Zermalt, or the, and there's a bear actually buried in the mountain there as well. Do you see it? Do you see what I see? Oh, yeah. How about this one? Okay. All right. You know why you can only have 31 flavors at any given time at this ice cream parlor? Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But right in the middle of the Baskin Robbins logo, look at the pink, people. Look at the pink. Is what? 31. You're so quick. You're even fast asleep. Okay. Here's one right here. We actually worked hard to bury three things in this logo, and most people have never caught it. Now, one of them is super easy. It's the little swishes. There's four of them because we actually have four creeks around our church. I don't know if you ever noticed that, okay? But there's two other symbols, and one of them is a Christian symbol. Do you see it? Y you shouldn't. It's not there. Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Okay, never mind. Just, just messing with you. I wanted to see if we had 50 people. I see it. Pastor, I see it. Then I would teach on lying next week. Okay, all right. Good, good. You guys are all spiritual. So Jesus took the 12 aside and told them we're going to go up to Jerusalem and everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He'll be delivered over to the Gentiles. They'll mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. <coughs> its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. They didn't see it. They couldn't see it. And frankly, they didn't want to see it because it didn't fit their theology or their expectations. This is the last time that Jesus will travel to the city of Jerusalem with his disciples. And now the countdown to Calvary has begun. It's just days away. And throughout the adult life of Jesus, he knew that he would be crucified for our sins. That's a heavy burden to bear. He even discussed about a year earlier what he was going to do in Jerusalem on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah and Moses. I don't know if you ever caught that, but in chapter 9, it says My, Moses and Elijah spoke with Jesus. They spoke about what? His departure, literally his exodo, his exodus, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Jesus knew months and even years in advance about the cross. 
He foresaw all the glory details long before they came about. He tasted all the bitterness and anticipated suffering, yet he never swerved from the path for a moment. To put it bluntly, there was a little bit of blood in every step Jesus took. So let me give it to you in principle form this morning, because I think principles help us build our life. There is no greater expression of love found in human history than Jesus Christ. Bar none. Bar none. He saw it coming years in advance, and he kept going. He just kept walking towards the cross. There's a strange verse in the book of Hebrews that says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And you go, well, where's the joy in crucifixion? The joy is not in crucifixion. The joy is what is purchased through crucifixion. He bought you. He bought me. Jesus saw, his 2020 vision saw not just a week ahead, it saw millennia out into the future. He knew that blood would be good to the last drop and saved to the last day. And so he had joy because he saw what was coming, all of it, even the hard chapters before the good stuff. And I want you to think about this. Think about as you watch him going about life. He's now, if my calculations are right, he might be eight days away from dying right now, okay? So here he is. He's calm. He's got incredible self-composure. He's externally focused, helping other people, not himself. You just don't see any panic or self-absorption in the Son of God. He's just lovingly committed to finish what he came to do for your benefit and for my benefit forever. That's what love looks like, people. You don't, love isn't two people running at each other at a beach with hair blowing. It's so much more than that. And one Bible commentator, William Barclay, put it this way. He said, many a man is capable of heroic action on the spur of the moment, but it takes a man of supreme courage to go on to face something which haunts him for days ahead and which by turning back he could escape. And in Jesus' case, it was coming for years. And he always walked towards the cross. I, I, I don't even know how to explain that. And this is not the first time he predicted that upcoming passion. This is the seventh time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus actually predicts his coming passion, crucifixion. If you want to kind of flip through the chapters with me, I just want to show you some of it's code language, but this is the seventh time he's told them about the upcoming crucifixion. If you go all the way back to Luke chapter 5, in the middle of a parable, Jesus says, the t chapter 5, verse 35, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from him. And the verb there is ripped violently from them. And then you flip forward to Luke 9, 22, and it says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised alive. Pretty clear. Go a little further to verse 44 in chapter 9. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Chapter 12, verse 50, I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. That's a little code. <coughs> then in chapter 13, Herod Antipas, who was the governor of Galilee, thought he was going to intimidate Jesus and kind of surprise him and threaten him. And Jesus just saw through that because he couldn't die in Galilee. He had to die in Jerusalem. So he says, you go tell that fox. I'll keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Chapter 17, verse 25. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And then you have this prophecy in chapter 18. And it just, he tells, tells them over and over again what's coming. He forewarned his disciples about what's on the immediate horizon, but they could not make any sense of his warnings because these things did not fit their theology and they did not fit their expectations. They could not see what Jesus saw 
And he was so clear. Take a look at this prophecy. There are nine points to this prophecy. The Son of Man, Jesus, is going up to Jerusalem to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. He'll be delivered to the Gentiles. He'll be mocked, insulted, spit upon, flogged, killed, and he's going to raise on the third day. Nine specifics. This was the clearest, most complete strongest, fullest, most graphic prediction to date of what was coming. And it was given with laser precision. Jesus wasn't freaking out. He just told him ahead of time. It's also the first prediction where he actually tells them the Romans are going to have a role in it, which is the ultimate sin of Israel. Give your long-awaited Jewish Messiah to outsiders to murder. That's like the ultimate sin. Jesus, I want you to notice this also. As uh, you think about all these prophecies Jesus gave them, it's interesting. It's, it's a theological expression. It's called progressive revelation, where God gives more and more light as you proceed forward, okay? And the issue is it's kind of a dimmer switch principle. Because he doesn't give more light to everybody, he gives more light to people that respond to light. So let me give it to you in principle form, okay? Principle number two this morning is, is that God's light becomes clearer and clearer as you choose to follow it. Now, I've watched people that have been part of church and they've walked with God, and it's like they never knew God. It's like the lights are out in their life. And the reason why is they stopped along the way responding to God's light, and the dimmer switch went down. They get dark, got darker. Whereas you just see other people, and they might be fairly new in the Lord, and they're just flying because they're responding in obedience to God's light. It's not a question of how much you know, it's how much you believe and you follow and you obey. God wants you to follow and obey. And you might think, well, Scott, that's kind of a weird thing to say because the disciples did not see or understand what Jesus was talking about. But listen, look at what they're actually doing. Though they are confused, they're still following. And isn't that the way of, the way of Christian faith? Do you understand everything about God? Do you ever have question marks about what he's doing? Oh my goodness, of course you do. You'll never get to the bottom of God. And the human race says, well, we're going to put you on trial, God. And as soon as we've figured out everything about you, we'll decide if we'll believe or not. Ha! Ah! You'll never get to a bottom of God. But the disciples decided that even with issues they did not understand, they would give God the benefit of the doubt and put them on ice because he'd proven so faithful. And they kept following. So Jesus kept giving them more light because they were obeying and following. It's really a beautiful thing. And, and what's interesting was he confused them so much because he ha they, they carried these faulty expectations about what the Messiah had to be like. The Messiah had to be a reigning. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to wipe out all the Gentiles and obliterate non-Jewish people and set up a kingdom and like Solomon where everybody had gold and silver and the radios were turned on and singing let the good times roll you know just come on man and bring on the they had this crass literal materialistic view of the kingdom and in that view you don't kill the Messiah the Messiah kills you if you're a Gentile and it just didn't fit Messiahs must conquer their foes, not be conquered by their foes. And that leads to principle number three, which is simply that we tend to see what we want to see. Oh my goodness, how true this is. We tend to hear what we want to hear. Have you, okay, maybe you'll get mad at me when I say this. I'll say it anyways. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why the prosperity gospel has gotten so much traction in America? The prosperity gospel is simply God wants you to be economically rich. Every Christian, he wants you to be rich. It's a lie. And yet it's got so much traction. You know why it's got so much traction? I'll tell you why. Because we want it to be true. Wouldn't it be cool if there was some little formula and God was just sort of a lever in the sky and you pulled it down? This is kind of like a gambling machine and you just get everything you want. It's just like that Mercedes God, it should be avocado green. Right? Just, ah, ah. But it's not true. But when you come back to this story, even those that are trying, like the disciples, to conscientiously and sacrificially follow Christ, they still experience times of disillusionment with the Lord because their spiritual expectations did not match what was happening outside of them, their daily reality. The same thing's true today. Because we all know, right, that Christians never have marital difficulty. 
right? And we all know that Christians never have children that rebel against God, right? And we all know that Christians never have jobs that go south, never go bankrupt, never have health problems, right? Because if you trust in Jesus, you live happily ever after. Amen? What's wrong with this church? <laughs> and then you read the Gospels and you say, Jesus didn't promise any of that. That's what you might expect. It's not what he promised. Instead, Jesus said, here's what I promise you. I promise you problems and tribulation. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And by the way, you need problems so you can grow up. You go home today and they say, well, what did the pastor say? He said, grow up. I'm not going to that church. <laughs> you know, what's interesting to me is, is I, the, these predictions were so not what they were seeing that I think that's why they remembered them. And they only remembered them after the resurrection and they thought, oh, but he said two years ago, he said the bridegroom has to be taken away from them. He said, I have a baptism to undergo. Oh, remember in Jericho, he said that because they were so incongruent and so incomprehensible and so out of the fitting pattern that they remembered them after the fact because, say it with me, hindsight is... 2020. Yeah, but we don't want hindsight. We'd like to develop faith so that when we're going into situations, we already see what God's doing rather than, oh, I missed it again. Right? Right. Second episode, chapter 18, verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked, What's happening? They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I love that expression. There's songs written from that little phrase. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. <coughs> Jesus stopped. I mean, they're, they're pilgrims sweeping down, eventually up into Jer Jerusalem. And they stopped. And he ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, I need 20 bucks. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what he's doing. He's begging, right? He said, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. If you just kind of pause this and go back 10 chapters earlier, one of my favorite verses in the Gospel of Luke is 951, which says this, At the, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He's moving towards the cross. Year after year, month after month, week after week, he's moving towards the cross. And this long final journey will end with a violent conclusion. But somewhere along the way, I think Jesus and his disciples were on the east side of the Jordan River as the Galilean pilgrim and pilgrims are coming down towards Jerusalem through Jericho, right? It's the Passover season. So tons of people are on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples go into this confluence of pilgrims as they're just arriving on the outskirts of this ancient city of Jericho, below sea level. It's 3,000 feet above to Jerusalem. It's going to be this big uphill walk and on the outskirts. And it's a very symbolic town. This is where the Jewish nation entered into the promised land and had their first conquest and entered into symbolic abundant living. So I could preach two sermons on this one, but I'll stick with the, the more literal one. And, and, and so <coughs> um, they find this blind guy. And this blind guy is doing what blind people did back then. It's a simple story. It's a beautiful story. Mark tells us what his name is. His name is Bartimaeus. We're going to call him Bart, okay? Uh, Bart actually just is like Bar. It means son. Timaeus was the father, though. So son of Timaeus. That's what we know. Matthew tells us there were actually two blind guys, but obviously one of them is the more dominant figure because he, 
He's the one spoken of in Mark and Luke. And so the story's beautiful, the story's beautiful, and, and it, it's simple, and it has 10 movements within it. First, we find a blind man sitting by the road, begging. That's how they, they had subsistence living. And this would be a good time because the pickings were better during times of pilgrimage because there's more people and they tended to be more generous as they were going up to worship God at Jerusalem. So he was expecting maybe, you know, this would be like your Christmas bonus, right? <clears throat> and then there's all this strange commotion and it's way more than normal. So what's going on? And they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. He's heard a lot about Jesus. He's processed this. He can't see with his eyes. But this guy is going to demonstrate 2020 vision with his soul, and he's going to lap the people that see around him. And so this is where the story actually starts getting interesting, because this blind guy goes into action, and he asks the Messiah for mercy, and the crowds try to shut him up. Let me back up for just a second. You go, well, I thought he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He did, but understand what that means. This is the first time you hear anybody call Jesus the son of David. People have been thinking about it and talking about it, but nobody wanted to say it out loud because that's very bold. That's a statement that he's the Messiah. To call somebody the son of David means this guy is the long-awaited for descendant of the great King David who is the rightful heir of the throne of Israel. He's a king. He's the Messiah. And you definitely don't want to say that with Romans around. And Jericho was full of Romans because it was a tax city. So this is like setting the clock on Jesus' death sentence because Tiberius was king. Tiberius was Caesar. And they killed Jesus about a week later for being the king of the Jews. This guy is blatantly and publicly calling Jesus the Messiah. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mercy means he wants him to step in and help to intervene, right? And the crowds try to shut him up. And, and, you know, remember earlier on when the babies were being brought to Jesus and the disciples say, go away, little ones, get out of here, right? Because they weren't worth it, right? And, and, and then now here's a blind guy and all the pilgrims are going to Jerusalem and he's saying, oh, just shut up, you know, just a blind guy, right? So they're trying to shut up the marginal people. But what's interesting to me is his response when they tell him to shut up. Because in verse 38, some of your Bibles say he called out. Some say he yelled or screamed out loud or whatever it is. But it's interesting because the word used in verse 38 is different than the word used in 39. In 38, he shouted. He had to because the crowd was loud. He had to get his volume above the noise of the crowd. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Okay, well, then what do the people do? Shut up, right? So what does he do? He's not going to shut up because he's like that pesky widow in the parable of this chapter that keeps knocking on the door asking for justice. He's persistent and insistent. He's doing what Jesus told people to do with God earlier on in this chapter. He's not going to let it go. Okay? And so the verb in verse 39 is like an animal scream. It's like an uncontrolled emotional explosion that throws off all decency, all normal uh, interaction of people. And I don't even want to try to make the sound, guys, but he's just screaming his fool head off. So they told him to shut up and he notches it up 10 times. Jesus, son of David, please stop. No, I need help. You know, I don't even think that gets it done. But what's cool in this thing is he becomes persistent and insistent. And in so doing, he shows faith. What does God want? We want cash and comfort. God wants faith, right? He's fishing in all of us for faith. So he finds it. And it's totally cool because this guy is just, he's giving Jesus what Jesus wants. And, and let me give it to you in principle form here because <clears throat> those who truly see Christ are going to find him. God's not playing hide and go seek with you. He just wants you to seek him. He wants you to give it some effort. He wants you to feel it. He wants you to enter into the intensity of it. And here's the problem. We have to work against our impatient culture to pull this one off. We have this culture of delayed gratification where we don't want to delay anything we want. We want it all yesterday. And so what happens is we settle for cheap substitutes for the deep things of God because the deep things of God are required only by those who wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait, you know that song? 
It only happens for those who wait on God. Because God said, Jesus said, if you want to find, you have to seek. If you want to receive, you have to ask. And if you want the door opened by God, you have to knock. You have to want it and you have to seek it. And you need to show some desperation too, especially if you're in a desperate place. I want to encourage you to conduct an experiment with God, okay? Maybe you haven't done this for a long time. Maybe you've never done this. But whatever is the most burning thing in your life right now, I'm going to encourage you to find a time to go into your bedroom. If it helps to turn the lights off, turn them off. And to get on your knees before your bed. And to just tell God everything. Stop telling other people all the stuff. And tell God everything. And if you need to let the tears run, let the tears run. And tell him everything. And then when you're done, be quiet and listen. Cast your burdens on the Lord because he cares for you. And just test and see if God won't speak into that. Or here's another one. Maybe you're saying, Scott, you know, I'm here and I like coming to church, but if you really knew, my heart is so cold towards God. It's just like a, it's a steel trap and it's just closed and I just can't hear. I'm just sort of non-responsive. Then I have another test I want you to conduct with God. <clears throat> I want you to admit that first. Remember, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're the ones that will be satisfied. And I want you to put your butt on a chair and open your Bible on the table and get a piece of paper and a pen and then tell God this. I will not stop reading until you talk to me. And then start reading and mean it. Read through the night if you need to. And I assure you, God will talk to you. Because God still speaks, people. He does. He still talks. Not, not only does he still talk, God still heals. God still restores marriages. God still retrieves prodigal children. God still turns desperate situations into rays of hope and life. God still takes people that are suicidal and puts them on a path where they can't believe they ever had thoughts like that. God still talks. God still saves. That's why we're here today, right? How desperate are you for God? You know, David put it this way. Uh, Israel doesn't have a lot of water. So this means more in an Israeli context. As a deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you. They had to go a long way to find water in Israel. How desperate are you? Because theologically, this blind man, he had 20-20 vision. He saw what other people didn't see, even though he literally didn't see. He grasped what Jesus really was, and that faith led him to blow past the hecklers and, all the, and keep shouting all the louder. And so he comes back at Jesus, and he tells Jesus, quite frankly, but what he wants. But first Jesus calls him and asks what he wants. It seems a little, you know, duh, I know you, but it's, it's actually calculated. Jesus saw in this man's space the beginnings of what he wanted, faith, but he wanted to bring it to an articulate uh, expression. So he stops this caravan and he calls the guy. And this is where Mark adds a couple of succulent details. Mark chapter 10, verse 49 says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. And the guy that calls the blind man, this is what he says, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. And this is what the guy does. He says, throwing his cloak aside, he got up to his feet and came to Jesus, obviously assisted, right? He knows something good. Something good is going to happen today, right? So this man's persistence gets him all the way to Jesus. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Duh. <laughs> no, it's not duh. What did this man want at the beginning of this day? Money. What do you want me to do for you? A hundred, hundred bucks will hold me over for a few days. A new tent would be nice, a new cloak, because I threw the other one off. Do you see what I'm saying? Jesus wanted him to say it with his lips because there was no one in Israel that could restore blindness. Go back into the Old Testament, it doesn't happen. Nobody can do it but God. 
And he is now actually expressing with his lips that he thinks Jesus can do what no one's ever done. What do you call that, people? I call that faith. That's the gold of faith. And so he says, Lord, I want to see. And I got to tell you guys, people, that's a great prayer for 2020. Maybe you could just say that regularly during this week. Lord, I want to see. Because let me tell you something. Your culture repeatedly lies to you about reality. Repeatedly lies to you about what's important. And if you're going to see through all that and understand the deep things of God, you are going to have to refine your spiritual vision with effort on your part so that you pursue what really matters in life. Because I assure you, your culture, which is rather anti-God in orientation, is not going to tell you what you most need to know in here. Lord, I want to see. Would you just say that with me? Lord, I want to see. Why don't you practice that prayer this week? 2020 vision, God. And so the next part of this story is the beautiful part. That's what he says, Lord, I want to see. And then Jesus heals him. But I want you to listen to actually how it happens. Verse 42, Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight. Did Jesus touch him? Did Jesus spit and make mud and rub it around on his eyes like he does in John 9? He always does it different, doesn't he? He did nothing but speak it. That's exactly how God created the world. He spoke it into existence. He took non-reality and made reality by just speaking it with the power of his mouth. I love God. He speaks life where there's non-life. And he spoke. And how quickly did it happen? It says over two hours, the man progressively saw better and better, right? No, it says immediately his sight was restored. Did you know? That our eyes are so complex that when we see images, we actually see them upside down because of the curvature of our retina and our mind manipulates them and turns them right side up. Did you know that? You better be grateful, otherwise you'd be walking around like this. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Did you know that the human eye possesses 130 million light-sensitive rods and cones that convert light into chemical impulses, and these signals travel at a rate of a billion per second to the brain, and every part of these signals has to work in perfect sync for you to see clearly and have 20-20 vision. Did you know that? Did you know that the father of evolutionary thinking, Charles Darwin, in The Origin of Species, actually states in his book that the eyeball disproves his theory? Did you know that? Evolution's a lie, because this is what he said. There is no way that something so spectacular and so perfect could evolve to that state. And then all of a sudden, oh, oh, now I can see. It either has to start that way or you never get it. That's the glory of God. I started reading about the eyeball until my eyeballs hurt. It was amazing. All this stuff. Can you imagine this guy's response when he's taken in his first sights? And who's the first person he sees? Jesus. He's heard his beautiful voice. Now he sees his beautiful face. I don't know if you... Technology in this area is making some great advances. And there's some new goggles and glasses and electro, uh, you know, impulses that they're, the medical world's able to do to help people that cannot see begin to see. Have you seen some of these on TV where all of a sudden these people start to see for the first time? I saw one back in November of a little boy. He was, he was like uh, 10 or 11, and he was talking with his mother, and they had a kind of a close, controlled environment, and, and he put on these, these goggles, and he saw his mother for the first time, and he first screams with elation, and then he starts to cry. And it's not tears of sadness. He's just overwhelmed. He finally gets to see the face of the mom that fought so hard for him to be able to see, and he's overwhelmed. It's all these emotions mixing up all together at the same time. You think about this guy. He is now taking in a part of his world that was not accessible before. He also just lost his job. <laughs> he can't beg anymore. 
an able-bodied man that can see has to work. I think he'll take the trade. But what's fascinating is how the story ends. Because you look at the last verses and you realize that God is praised and the healed man follows Jesus. Immediately he received his sight, verse 43, and followed Jesus. What do you call a follower of Jesus today? You call them a disciple, right? A Christian, a disciple, Christ follower. Immediately he could see, immediately he followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. So everybody's praising God in this festive group of pilgrims moving up towards Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And this guy, Jesus, just got a new disciple, a new traveling companion, and a new voice to spread the news. Can you imagine this guy? It's 17 miles to Jerusalem, and I'll bet they couldn't shut him up in Jerusalem either. So everywhere he's going, he said, hey, you got a minute? You see these eyes? <laughs> I see your eyes too. You always call you. I was there, and I didn't. And then he go put me them in a boom, and he's just telling them. You, I gotta tell somebody. And it, really, I, I gotta save it till this is the last principle here, folks. Principle five: true obedience and discipleship spring, spring from a grateful heart. Yeah, I don't follow Jesus because I have to. I follow Jesus because I want to. I follow Jesus because of what He's done for me. This guy. He can now see, and you can't shut him up. You know, I, how much has God done for you? My dad died two weeks ago. My dad was 93. His body wasn't working. We're watching the effects of the curse because we all live under the curse. But here's something that's fascinating to me. Today, what we do is we put all the emphasis as people, when we see a passage like this, we think, oh, um, the greatest thing Jesus could ever do is relieve some temporary physical ailment that we have or some deformity or some pain that we have, and he can. But just know this, people. Every person Jesus ever healed, every person he ever raised from the dead died again. So that was never the, the end of the story. The end of the story and what you need to see here, what you need to see here is, is that Jesus came to save you forever, not just temporarily. Don't put the focus on the temporary stuff. Go for the stuff that lasts. Jesus came to heal you forever. Jesus came as the king of the kingdom to give you the keys to get into the kingdom forever. He doesn't want you temporarily healed. He wants you good to go forever. That's what you need to take away from this passage. You want 2020 vision? That's what you need to see. Jesus is heading to his death and he's fine because he sees beyond it. And while he's doing that, he gives somebody his physical sight who had already acquired spiritual sight to help other people see what they could not see. Do you see? Do you see what I see? We're going to call our ushers forward now. I'm hungry. <clears throat> I see hunger on the horizon, being satisfied. So I'm going to call our worship team back out. And I'm going to pray for you while we're preparing for our offering, okay? God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the hope that Jesus brings that death does not get the last word for Christ's followers. I thank you that you still speak. I thank you that you still heal. I thank you that you still, you still reconcile broken marriages, retrieve prodigal children, heal diseases. Jesus, I thank you that your blood is still good to the last drop. Jesus, we so want to honor you this year. We so, we just want to pray with that man. Lord, we want to see. I want to see. God, I just want to pray that this would be a year of ridiculous spiritual hunger and thirst for all my hearers and for myself as well because we're not going to pursue you unless we're hungry for you. And I, I kind of think even that hunger and thirst comes from you. So God, draw us to yourself and then satisfy us with yourself. You're our road, you're our walk, you're our destination. We love you this morning. 
And Jesus, we so want to honor you. We're going to give to you. We're going to sing to you right now. But God, we want that praise to continue when we walk out these doors today too. Lord, we want to see. In Jesus' name, amen.